you all. No, thank you for being here. Um, welcome to our first Third Thursday lecture of this year. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> I think in the first year of the school. Yep. Um, and it was born really out of this comment that we were hearing from parents uh, of, our, of our students who comment with something like, wow, my, my child keeps coming home <coughs> talking about all these cool things, and I wish I got to do that. <laughs> um, so here we are. Um, this community, St. Constantine School and College, is a community of learners. We take very seriously the idea that asking the questions, discussing important ideas, hearing from people who have thought a long time about those things, good questions and good ideas, um, those are important and they don't stop when you graduate. We should keep doing them. Um, and the fact that you're here shows that you agree with that. So every third Thursday of the month during the academic year, we come together, we hear from our faculty, a variety of backgrounds and expertise areas. We hear sometimes from guests from outside of our community that we invite in. This evening we get to hear from our founding president, Dr. John Mark Reynolds. I'm very excited um, that we get to do this this evening with him. Dr. Reynolds has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Rochester. He is the author of numerous books and articles. You may have heard of one called When Athens Met Jerusalem. He has spent a long time thinking about what it means to be a good citizen, what it means to build a good city. So I'm very excited that tonight we get to hear from him on both of those things as he discusses democracy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reynolds. So an interesting thing about being a Christian and thinking about forms of government is we get to think about it with a fairly open mind. Uh, I have a thesis, and you can argue with me about it during the Q&A, uh, and the thesis I'm beginning with is one that almost all Christians in almost all places at almost all times who have talked about this have held. doesn't mean it's right, but it's very common. It's almost universal. And that is that Christians themselves, if left alone, can tolerate any just form of government and that almost any government will probably be fairly unjust simultaneously. There isn't a golden age in the past that we can go back to when everything was great, nor is there a golden age right now, some kind of perfect utopia, and we're not going to have utopia in this life. Yet, we should seek justice and love mercy. So though we don't expect everything to be perfect, we're not content with the imperfections, yet notice this tension means our expectations are fairly realistic. We are not waiting for some perfect person. Other, if your name's not Jesus, and your mother wasn't Mary, and the other parent wasn't God, we don't expect that you be a perfect ruler. That is the perfect ruler that was, is, and will come. Because the second thing we have to remember is that the kingdom of God for Christians isn't some future event. It was, it is now, and it is to come. So sometimes when we look at the past, we say, well, we can't judge people in the past for their injustice because standards of those times. No, we judge everyone by the standard of God's perfect justice. Mm -hmm. And so when people enslaved other people, we can say that was wrong. We can say, I, there's a bingo card somewhere in this room probably that's waiting for me to say, Nazis were bad. <laughs> Bolsheviks were bad. Usually people check off a little box because it's my low-hanging moral fruit for the evening. Uh, we can judge different times and different places. So the colonial period itself was engaged in some degree of injustice. And we can keep score in ways like that. But having said that, we judge ourselves. And so we know that we too are almost surely engaged in some degree of injustice. And so we judge as we would wish to be judged. <coughs> Sorry. And when we have historical heroes, for example, 
There are heroes because of what they got right, not for what they got wrong. So we can keep score about what they got wrong. A nice thing about being inside the church is we already know there are saints of the church that had ideas, even in theology, that we think are mistaken. And they surely did things and had opinions that we think were wrong. How did they become saints? Well, if you're Lucy, if you're Saint Lucy, you're a young girl, we don't know for sure how old, and you chose correctly, and the Roman government acted unjustly, and you saw the face of God. You took the short road to God. You didn't do that much. A single act sanctified your life. After all, if you were on RMS Titanic, and you were one of the people that maybe hadn't lived a great life up to that point in your life, you could end well in a way to make your life heroic if you were one of the wealthiest people in the world, and you stood with a lot of money in your pocket, and you realized there weren't enough spaces on the lifeboats for all the women and the children, and you let the lifeboat go, and you didn't take a space, we don't call you a hero because maybe your life had been well spent up to that moment, but when history called, the bright light of history called, you behaved well. Do you remember COVID? If you're a grown-up in here, you surely do, but probably even most of the students remember COVID. Do you remember some people lost their heads and went mad? We talked to our students back then and we said, look, we're not sure what's right to do. You're not sure what's right to do. We're going to make mistakes. But right now, the bright light of history is shining on us. Let's try not to make fools of ourselves. Let's try to be calm and carry on. So that even if we make mistakes in this historic moment, we will have done justice with mercy. The best we knew and been calm, and look back on what we did, and not feel ashamed. So when we have heroes, when we look at the past, we don't have to lie about what has occurred, we don't have to cover anything up, we have to say, what is noble and good and true is this thing, and we're going to build on that, and try to be at least as good. So in the entire history of humankind, there was a man, and very few men, who though he acted unjustly towards many individuals, when he could become tyrant of a continent, chose to go home. And that's George Washington. So we do not honor him for his errors, but we look at what is a very unusual decision. When people are thrusting power on you, and we say what? The choice to take that power, which in some ways often you have misused in your life, and set it aside in that world historic moment, almost uniquely, and we honor that person for that decision. And we're very clear what we don't honor an individual for. And remember, we judge with the judgment what? We wish to be judged by. Ever notice that you would like to be remembered for your best moments and not your worst moments? And so when we look at forms of government, we have to step back and say, this side of heaven is any form of government going to be perfect? No, because it will have people in it. I was once asked my political party, was I a Republican or a Democrat? And I kind of dodged the question. I said I was a monarchist because I was pretty sure that Jesus was Lord. <laughs> so for Christians, ultimately, we are all monarchists. There is no king, ultimately, but... King Jesus. Now, kind of unexpectedly tonight, I'm going to give one cheer, not three cheers, <laughs> one cheer for American democracy. And I'm going to give one cheer for American democracy because I don't expect perfection. In fact, I expect vast imperfection. 
But just as in a human being, I try to see, are they headed towards justice? So, whether it's Ronald Reagan or Barack Obama, people of different political parties have been able to describe the American system as trying to head towards justice, of having placed a promissory note towards liberty that it gradually began to pay off for more and more Americans. That doesn't justify the fact that it was hypocritical. It does say that in a broken world, a trajectory that's going the right way, if we can keep it going the right way, is a good trajectory. And that democracy, a place where the people govern, to give Hamilton's very brief definition, where sovereignty, where is sovereignty for a Christian? Where does it have to be? In King Jesus. Who is Lord? Jesus is Lord. But if you're a non-Christian here tonight, you don't have to be afraid of a Christian who says that and understands what they're saying. Why? Because I want you to know that when you look in the mirror, there but for the grace of God is God. Think about it. When you look in the mirror, there but for the grace of God is God. How many of you are not God tonight? Yes, you're not God. I, and we're probably not even that holy. So when we say Jesus is Lord, that implies something very important. Who isn't Lord? I am certainly not Lord. Which means if I take ultimate sovereignty, if anyone takes ultimate sovereignty from a Christian point of view to themselves, they are engaged in tyranny. Who is Lord? Jesus is Lord. You're not. The people aren't Lord. The king isn't Lord. The government official, the bureaucrat. No one is Lord but King Jesus. And who gives us our rights? Our rights come from God. And God isn't going to take away your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So when the government takes away your rights, the image of God placed inside of you isn't honored by the government. They can pass a hundred laws, a thousand laws. Do you still have that right? Yes. 2,000 years of Christian thought universally say your rights come from God and they cannot be taken away from you justly. Only a tyrant can do that. So I'd like to suggest that we right away begin with a distinction between who is sovereign, God, and who governs. Where does governance come from? And I'm going to suggest that ultimately it must come from the people for this very simple reason. And I'm a very simple-minded guy, so I'm going to begin with a very fundamental thing about my life. I love my wife. Now, this is very depressing uh, to a lot of people. If I told you that Hope and I have fights, you would thank me for my honesty. Thank you for being honest and sharing. But it's also the case that I love my wife. I, I'm sorry about that. I know it's a little annoying. Uh, it's even a little gross, like, ah, if you're a kid. If you're my kids, you leave immediately. <laughs> but here's what I know when I come home. We've been married a gajillion years. It's a technical philosophical term. Don't use it unless you have a PhD in philosophy. But no, we've been married a long time. But despite that, when I come home, and she comes back from what she's been doing, I do not have a right to demand something of her. I need her consent. And by need, I mean that's what love wants. Love desires consent. When I met Hope, she was in ninth grade, I was in 10th grade, and I sent the world's worst note to her, and I got the worst response back. I know all of this, by the way, because she still has it. She just means I win. <laughs> but notice, notice, I didn't want to send a note that said, here's why you have to love me. And then have her say, well, I don't even like you, but I guess if I have to, I'm going to love you. 
love a tyrant, I want you to hear this, an evil person or a tyrant is content with seizing what they want. What does a lover do? A lover hardly dares ask, let alone demand. Now, what does that have to do with anything? If we know one thing about God as Christians, how do we define God? What is the single definition of God that Christians stick with most closely? God is love. And we are created in God's image to be loved by God and in God. And so when we approach each other, our approach must be a matter of consent. So now I'm going to sound political. As a result, for a Christian, governance must be by the consent of the governed. Or it's tyranny. Government must be by the consent of the government, or of the governed. Tom Posey, God loves you. You have the same rights as any other human being. And so when you do not give your consent to the government, there's a problem. Not a problem for you, a problem for the government. Because the government cannot ultimately survive. Now, of course, you have people that are crazy, you have people that don't know what they're about, we have small children that we have to govern in different ways, but ultimately for an adult, for a full-fledged, fully functioning adult, government has to exist by consent, because love is ultimately how things go. Now, let me suggest, I said how many cheers for American democracy? One. One. The story of American democracy is a story of fulfillment and sometimes a story of failure of fulfillment, of possibility. I'm going to say a really simple thing. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I will pause and take questions. I I used to build a whole talk around this, but because we live in this moment, I no longer feel I have to prove something. Here's a very simple fact. Most people can be active politically, governed. For about 70 years. I mean, maybe by reason of strength longer, but the World War II generation is almost gone. Just this year, the last person to participate in Great Britain as a pilot in the Battle of Britain died. So far as I know, there are no pilots left from the Battle of Britain. I I find that sad. The greatest generation is slowly slipping away. You have to be about 100 to have been actively involved in the Second World War. And I know we're trying to get a lot of mileage out of our current political leaders in both parties now, but we don't have any political leaders in their hundreds. We have no members of our ruling class that fought in the Second World War. In fact, remember the death of the Queen? So far as I know, she was the last serving ruler to serve in the Second World War. So the World War II generation has passed from the scene. I'd like to suggest that about every 70 years, just because of biology, I'm not being a prophet, it's not like magical numbers, it doesn't always work out perfectly, every society will have to renew itself. Because the generation that got the thing going and understood it at its very roots, but also made big mistakes. Also made big mistakes. I said at the start, where's the golden age? No place. We don't look nostalgically back to the past. We're grateful for what was done correctly, but we love our country, her wrongs to right. And so every 70 years, we want to pick up the mantle of the greatest generation, We want to get rid of what didn't work because, after all, our current crisis was created by the errors of our last solution. I sometimes have friends, I I really love Russian history, and there is no moment in world history 
that I think is more devastating than the Russian Revolution of 1918, where something great was destroyed and bad choices were made. But I want to pause and say this. We would never want to restore exactly what existed in 1913 because 1913 was sowing the seeds that produced 1918. Now, God knows millions died. And whatever mistakes they made, they paid the price. But I want you to pause, and I want you to add 70 years to 1918. What do you get? When I started teaching at 20, 10th grade social studies, I worked this out as a little kid, and I said to my 10th grade social studies class, I bet something wild will happen in Russia around 1989. Mm -hmm. wow. Because that's what you'd expect. And of course, because 10th graders are obnoxious, sorry 10th graders, <laughs> someone wrote it down. And when it occurred for like 10 minutes, I was a folk hero. But 10th graders, they don't care. That by the next day, they wanted me to do cool party tricks again, and I had nothing. Because it isn't being a prophet to say this. The Maoist revolution in China took place when? When was it completed? When did we get a social order that was fairly stable in Maoist China? 49? Yeah, somewhere around there. So we would expect a kind of need for cultural renewal, either positively or negatively, somewhere around when? Now, we would expect a kind of crisis of legitimacy inside of the Chinese state. Now, this doesn't have to mean a collapse or a revolution. In fact, it usually doesn't mean that. Often it means things get better, and if we look quickly at American history, we can see how this goes. Here's my good word for the Constitution of 1789. This is about when it was implemented, not when it was written. So the Constitution of 1789. When it was implemented, more people in a large state could participate in government than in any country in the history of humankind. Sovereignty was recognized in more individuals than any nation of any size that had existed in human history. That's pretty good. Let's all pause. That's pretty good. Now, we could also list how incomplete that was, and there's no justifying it, so don't. Seventy years after the revolutionary generation, the sins of the fathers undermined the Constitution of 1789. Just about exactly 70 years later, what do we get? The American Civil War. Because of course we do. The Constitution, as Frederick Douglass pointed out, was deeply flawed. It needed those great Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, to become more just, to fulfill its promise in a deeper way. Now that, we also blew reconstruction, should indicate to us something was going to go awry again. Because something's always going awry. No generation gets this perfectly. But I will say this, the government that came out of the Civil War was better than the government that went into it. Because certain social injustices were wiped away forever, if only race-based slavery. That's good. There's my controversial take for today. <laughs> Getting rid of race-based slavery was a great good. Now, we were also slow to do it. So only one cheer for democracy, because the Russian autocracy, the Tsar, got rid of serfdom in Russia without a civil war before we got rid of slavery in the great American Republic. So keep that in mind. Democracy, not perfect. Republics, not perfect. 1865, go about 70 years later, what would you expect? A crisis point right around the 1930s. 
That's my grandparents' lifetime. The Great Depression, the Second World War. There were certain things overlooked during the Gilded Age that sowed seeds that came to bear in the Great American Crisis of the 30s and 40s. And again, I would like to suggest that in many ways, the nation that came out of the Second World War was a better, stronger place, had more justice than the nation that went into it. But we sowed the seeds of some of our own problems. My dad will tell you, he's 86, a very simple thing. My grandparents, very wise people, went through the Great Depression, and what were they constantly saying to my dad and my Aunt Jean? <clears throat> dad said this, and everyone he knew their age constantly said this, you'll never have to go through what we went through. Mm -hmm. We're going to shield you from that. And sometimes people are critical of the generation that grew up in the 60s, but Dad said, following the author Peter Beagle, the 60s, which did great justice in some areas, did great injustice in others because of the foul harvest of children spoiled by their parents in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. The things the greatest generation got right Fighting the Bolsheviks and the Nazis, that's really a lot of good. Can we just pause and say, knowing that Stalin and Hitler were both bad, way to go, Papa. Yeah, right? Like, stop. Civil rights movement, way to go, guys. Good job. Simultaneously, making an idol out of personal peace and affluence and trimming certain liberties as a result may have set us up for a problem. May have set us up for a problem. Where does sovereignty reside? God. What if we decided that sovereignty resided in you? Notice the difference? If sovereignty resides in God, and he gives you rights, you discover those rights and live by them. If we decide, spoiled 50s kid, that sovereignty is in you, my precious child, that's different. That's different. Suddenly, if I cross your will, I have a problem. Because you're the God King. It's hard to have 360 million God Kings. Have you ever just looked at a nursery? Where all those little kids think they're the God King. Like, that's a problem. Now imagine 360 million of them. Now, I used to have to make this argument. I used to, I'm not making this up. You can find me, uh, you can Google it. It's in Viola 2012, I think. I made the argument that somewhere around the presidential election of 2016, the World War II order would collapse and that the culture of celebrity would become paramount. I even proposed a particular presidential candidate that caused uproarious laughter in the 2012 room, but we don't have to go there. Uh, why? I just picked the person with the highest Q rating that people knew about that had political interest and said, well, here would be a plausible candidate. Now, again, you don't have to know very much to say this. Because as the World War II generation passes from the scene, what would you expect? The generation that created systems based on typewriters and filing cabinets, academic systems based on, we need a general education. We can't individualize it because we've got all these kids that the GI Bill sent into high school and college, so we're gonna have credit systems and general education, and we're going to make you jump through hoops to get there. The rich people, like at Oxford and Cambridge, we individualize their education, but we're going to give you sort of generic, almost like that education. No one would have done that if they could have individualized, but they didn't have the technology to enable it with that many people. And so eventually, the mistakes of the World War II generation, a culture of celebrity, a culture of overindulging people,
came home. Simultaneously, their great victories give us opportunity to renew the republic and make it better. So are we doomed? No. Don't be stupid. Realize we can't go back, can we? We wouldn't want to. We must go forward, and we need to pick up what the founders got right, what the Civil War generation got right, what the greatest generation got right, and play it forward under sovereign God. And my suggestion tonight, the safest way to do that would be a renewal of the American Republic. Maybe. One heritage we have in the United States, this is John Locke and William Blackstone, for those of you keeping score at home. These are like their trading cards. You can have them. <laughs> if you have an original John Locke philosophy trading card, it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> at this point. It's a whole market most of you don't realize exists. So just sarcasm. Uh, in human history, people always think they live in awesome times and everybody before them was really stupid. Have you noticed that? So the Middle Ages, which, that's how we get international law, good thing. And that's how we get modern science, a good thing. That's how we got industrialization. Lots of good things coming out of the Middle Ages. And a group of people kind of built on that and decided we alone represent a rebirth of culture. So they called themselves the Renaissance. And almost everything that we're normally taught about the Renaissance is kind of false. Because it's such a big generalization. So for example, when I was in school, I was taught that in 1453, the Turks took Constantinople. There was a flood of Greek knowledge and literature that came into the West, and it led to a rebirth of kind of classical knowledge. Am I the only one that heard that in school? Uh, that's almost entirely wrong. By 1453, there wasn't much left of Constantinople to take. And the Byzantines themselves, the Eastern Romans, who thought of themselves, the Eastern Romans thought of themselves as, here's a wild thing, as Romans. There's a meme going around, how often do you think about the Roman Empire as a man? I work at St. Constantine. <laughs> So when am I not thinking about the Romans, right? The, the Eastern Romans didn't call themselves Byzantines. They called themselves Romans. In fact, the Turks still call us Rom Romans because that's what we were. And when the culture was constantly being fed, particularly in a place called Florence in northern Italy, cultivated by Constantinople, there was a continuous knowledge of Greek so that the Renaissance, some of the developments of the Renaissance were more organic than they were dramatic breaks. The big dramatic break was the Black Death. When a third to half of your population dies of a disease, that's a big thing. It's my deep insight for tonight. That's a big break. In the 13th century, it looked like the world was going to go on a great trajectory out of places like France. The 13th century, an amazing time. I think Aquinas, Dante, lots of good things are going on. The Black Death set us back, probably hundreds of years. In a way, the Renaissance is a rebirth from that hard time that came out of the Black Death, the closest thing to an actual Dark Age that Western Europe experienced as a whole. Those people, though, thought of themselves as the smart ones. But come on, you guys know enough to know that isn't right, right? They stood high because they stood on the shoulders of giants. In the same way, somewhere in the 17th, maybe 18th century, people began to say, oh, those people, kind of Renaissance, late medieval, they didn't get it, we get it because we are enlightened. Uh, because, think of it this way, when I was a kid, Star Trek, the original series, I attempted to work with NASA and postulate what the world would look like in a couple hundred years. And they did a pretty good job with it. But they made the mistake that people always make 
they think past success is going to equal yes now if you are Queen Victoria it took you roughly the same length of time to get from Britain to Babylon as it had for an ancient Roman travel by the time Victoria died in 1901 you could go around the world in a lot less than 80 days generally with one passport do you see how amazing that is? Which meant over Gene Roddenberry, a World War II veteran's life, he saw things go from mostly muscle power transportation with some railroads and things to Concorde jets, annihilating space and time. You could fly faster as a regular passenger in his era than we can right now as a passenger. And so what did he assume would happen for the next two or three hundred years? Man, we'll get something like warp drive. The stars are ours. Because it will keep going. On the other hand, computer technology was moving along slowly in incremental steps. And so you'll notice the computers on Star Trek, the original series, are less powerful than your phone. Which in many ways is modeled on the communicators from the original <laughs> Star Trek. What happens with any change is you need super geniuses to make the big insights that aggregate until sort of everybody else can begin to build. And so things take off and explode. Think of computer technology over our lifetimes, grown-ups. Almost no computers in my lifetime dominate my wrist as a computer more powerful than any computer I own until about 10 years ago, is my guess. And that's amazing. So what do we assume now in modern science fiction, contemporary science fiction? Wow, 200 years from now, computers are gonna be even more amazing. What is more likely to occur is that we'll tap out the technology and stagnate. And then something else that we can't even predict, some area of technology that seems very stable, will suddenly take off and take us forward. We don't know. Past success, what do the investors tell you? Is no guarantee of future outcomes. Things don't stay the same. You need super geniuses after a certain point. And so progress stagnates. In the same way, the Enlightenment developed important ideas, but how could they get those ideas? Because the medievals, Christians, West and East, had produced the hard ideas that enabled them to take off with the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. And so, having gotten an inheritance from their grandparents, like a lot of people, what did they, what did they say? Woohoo! <laughs> Papa and Anna, they were dumb. <laughs> we figured it out. Well, of course you did. I mean, the wheel is an obvious thing until you haven't thought of it. And whole great cultures existed that never figured out how to use the wheel. But when somebody did figure it out, think of the super genius who said, wheels, axles. Then the rest of us could say, ha, way to go, idiot people, before this. I've got a cart. Call it the cartman. No, the Enlightenment. Now, I want to say, amongst Christians, if you go Google the Enlightenment, and you find what Christians have to say about it, we tend to say goofy things about the Enlightenment because people in the Enlightenment decided they knew everything. And once you run into people who've decided they know everything, it's like meeting a 10th grader. I'm so sorry, 10th graders. It's not your fault. Uh, the temptation as a parent is to say, you don't know anything. Right? Your 10th grader may be right. In fact, they often are. But we can't hear it 
because y'all are so obnoxious, just stop. <laughs> Help us. I, I know, maybe we're, we're just dumb. We can't hear very well because we're old. And we, back in the day, you had like these headphones you wore all the time with things you carried around with you that just blasted music in your ear. So we don't hear well, at least at my age. And so, look, we sometimes look at the Enlightenment people and we treat it as if it was a giant pile of secularism. And so I have heard Christians say, American government was born out of a kind of secularization of medieval culture, a rejection of the church, a rejection of theology, and this is simply false. Because the Enlightenment was a giant period of time, and I, here's a really big insight. American government has mostly taken place in the English language. Aren't you glad you came here to learn these really profoundly complicated things? Which should suggest to you that our roots in the Enlightenment are probably not mostly French. <laughs> Whoa! Ah, but some. What if we look towards the English Enlightenment thinkers? And what we get are mostly John Locke and William Blackstone. And William Blackstone, if you went and read him, comes out of the English natural law tradition based on the sovereignty of God, a continuous process of law, and ultimately where do rights and governance exist? In you. And we find them in the king in parliament. This is a big deal. Blackstone was required reading for any American lawyer for a century. The Supreme Court has quoted Blackstone more than almost any author over its first century of existence. Blackstone, you have to know to know American government. And Blackstone is not at all secular. In fact, here's a novel thought. What if your rights, what if you are endowed by your creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the ownership of private property? Does that sound familiar? This is a combination of William Blackstone and John Locke. And John Locke was a Christian apologist. Like, seriously, he wrote a book of Christian apologetics. He also was a flawed human being. I do not agree with his epistemology. If you care about that, you're probably a boring person like I am. But I don't like his epistemology. And he had very bad ideas about who was human that caused real problems in American thought. So I just want to pause and say, John Locke, not perfect. But John Locke also really advanced the notion that sovereign people could eventually rebel against a tyrant. Why? Unlike Hobbes or some of other Enlightenment thinkers, the government didn't give you your rights. Who did? And so if the government begins to take away your rights with great care and thought, you could legitimately rebel against the government. When Nat Turner struck out in a slave rebellion, he was true to English Enlightenment thought. Right? And when injustice occurred, when the king and parliament refused British subjects their rights as Englishmen, John Locke said, would have said, and in fact, Edmund Burke, the great British parliamentarian, father of modern conservatism, sided with the American revolutionaries because he said they're fighting for what? Their rights against tyranny. So notice, half a cheer for the English Enlightenment. But it got some things wrong. And we don't have to forget about them. But when you hear people say, who are Christian, the Enlightenment was all secular and all forgot about God, they're just wrong. 
Because remember, other people, enslaved people, Americans of all kinds, took these ideas and they didn't just repeat what Locke said, they began to apply them in new ways. Remember what I said about technology, it's true of any idea. Someone like Locke or Blackstone can come up with an idea and say, really, we just mean men. No women apply. And some woman, Abigail Adams, is going to say to John Adams, don't forget the women. Because once an idea starts, what can't you do? Just say stop. You can beat the idea in an argument, but you can't just say, well, we didn't mean everyone. When we said all men were created equal and endowed by their creator, we didn't mean you. Well, that's hard to do because soon you say, am I not a man and a human? Well, yeah, but is a bad argument. Ever notice that? Young adults, if you get down to yeah, but, you're going to lose. <laughs> so whatever's coming next isn't going to work in the history of ideas that no yeah, buts have ever won. So while there is no American golden age, there is possibility to the story. Wait, stop, pause. We're in a reboot time. We could all get depressed. Or we could get a vision of the cross and build a new city kept in safety for all time. A city in which justice rolls down like water and where people's rights to life, liberty, and the ownership of property were kept safe. All of them. Who's stopping us? Well, I don't know. But right now, no one. Look, here we are. Tim Mott, are you created in the image of God? Aye, aye. Are you fit to govern? Depends on what I'm governing, but generally no. <laughs> yeah, so in aggregate, in aggregate, no, this is a really good answer. Here's what you should do. You should take your consent and give it to someone to govern for you. We shall call that something. <laughs> it could be a monarchy. The, the English just renewed their vows to Charles III. Charles III governs by the consent of the governed. I, the minute nobody wants Charles to be king, what's going to happen? He's not king. Or he has to act the tyrant. That's it. You've got it. We don't want you running anything. <laughs> well, we don't want me running anything. You're stuck with me here. <laughs> the possibility, look at this, the possibility that authority comes from God and is delegated to each human so that we can delegate it. That's the magic of democracy. Legitimate authority, then, it's the king in parliament, depends on the consent of the governed, as we've seen. The covenant, like a marriage, like a marriage between the sovereign and the subject or the state and citizen, is sacred. Brothers and sisters, Sometimes our leaders have been cheating on us. Or they've been abusive. And so it's time that we said, no. And we can, because we are not just the governed. The governors exist by our consent even if we lived in a monarchy. Now, there is a good argument to be made for a Christian monarchy. We, after all, 
go to a school name. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> However, we're thousands of years down the road. And the concentration of power in a small group of people or in one person has tended to not go well, whereas diffuse power has tended to go better. Is this always true? No. It's a close call. But if you give one person all the power, a lot of things would get fixed. I, I'll tell you what. If I put this school's 10th grade in charge of the government, there would be a blessed change. I believe in you guys. I think it would be better if you ran our government as a whole than what we've got. <laughs> if we'll just give you all the authority and you can clean things up, it will be better until you got rotten. Because power that concentrated, it's not great. And I don't be simple-minded, but power does tend to corrupt. And so having power as diffuse as possible often protects the liberty of the individual. So one cheer for democratic mechanisms. Notice they can exist with a sovereign king, as in Great Britain. They can exist in a republic, as in the United States. They can have many different economic systems. But this critical element is that your God-given rights are protected. Well, what are problems of democracy? Uh, here's an insight. A big group of people can be dumber than they are individually. I, this is just a fact. Have you ever noticed that if you get a lot of people together at a party, they'll act in ways, especially if it's dark, that they never act alone? that if you get a big group of people, you can stir them up and they will do terrible things, mobs are bad. A giant group of people can be scary and do injustice. And so a problem of democracy is the problem of mob rule. How do we keep this from occurring? Well, the founders came up with some ideas. But here is a criticism of democracy. It's a weird criticism. Do you know that justice, think about this for just a second, you're going to think I'm nuts. Justice, this could drive you crazy. So I mean, <laughs> justice, justice, justice. What is justice? Do you want justice? Uh, good answer. Man, if you get exactly what you deserve, if you get exactly what you deserve, uh-oh. Yeah. And who are you going to trust? What human being, not named Jesus, whose mother is Mary, are you going to trust to do justice on you? Because, I'll tell you the truth, equality amongst humans is false. Nobody in here is equal to anybody else. That's really good news. Who does God love? He loves you. What's your name? Does he love you just the way you are? He does. He made you, and he wants to redeem you and make you better than you are. Make you holy. He wants to live forever with you in eternity. Are you the same as she is? No, because she's awesome. This is starting to sound like gross again, like people are going to want to throw up in their mouths again. It's all getting cheesy and stuff. But think about it. Are you awesome? Yes. Are you objectively beautiful? Yes. Are, are you the same as anyone? No. So if you were perfect, what you should get is different than what I should get. You know, if somebody knew everything, oh, that would be God, they could give us perfect justice. So why then do Americans talk about equality? And why do we have to be careful with it? Equality is a fiction 
that we use because we cannot trust our fellow human beings with justice. Yeah, to know everything might be to forgive everything. But we don't know everything. So I can't be trusted to treat you as you deserve. And you as you deserve, which wouldn't be the same, would it? Because you're different. And you have different backstories. And you deserve different things. But if I start doing that, how many of you know I have biases and sinfulness and plain old ignorance? So a clever thing that Christian philosophers did is we said this, we're going to treat you all as equal where? Before the law. Before the law. But that's only because we can't trust the law to love you. You don't want the government to love you, folks. <laughs> the government loves you. Bad things are about to happen to you. Right? It's like a Greek god. You don't want Greek gods to love you. <laughs> Zeus, go away. I'm not even here. <laughs> don't hate me. Don't love me. I'm just here. But, but look, notice in a Christian commonwealth, Families work with justice and mercy, not with equality. I get paid to teach kids, but I didn't charge mine. Why? Because I gave them a test? Because I sat and figured it all out? Why are you so nice to your kids, I hope? <laughs> Why? Why do you give your kids treats on the way home? You should give your kids treats. But you aren't going to give the other kids treats. Man, this isn't hard. Somebody tell me. They're your kids and you love them. You're not my kid. <laughs> so in all justice, when I die, I'm leaving you nothing. Nothing. <laughs> And that's good! <laughs> Woo! Listen, I, I was a philosopher all this time. If you're waiting to inherit anything from me, you're in real trouble. <laughs> so, do you see the difference, though? The Christian idea of equality, we have to be careful with it. Man, you don't want the government to treat you unequally, do you? Because you can't trust it. But I hope in love, your friends come to know you and have mercy. Believe it or not, one reason we give our executives in most places pardon power is this Christian notion that equality would kill us all. And every once in a while, justice comes down, but it's too hard. And so we'll give our governor or our president the careful use of pardon power when justice becomes injustice. We know how that goes, right? Someone's in a horrible situation where they're being abused and they kill someone. And they do some time. And then what might the governor do? Enough. Enough. Do you see how Christian that is? But do you see how dangerous it is? Because even the pardon power in the hands of wickedness can be misused. So we can never quite trust anyone with power. Which is why I'm for democracy. So that at least the people can say at some point no! No. Our roles shape us, and this is a problem of democracy. The docker, the dock worker, the old expression goes, why should the docker have the same vote as the don, the professor? Well, nowadays, if we look at what most professors believe, we'd give the docker two votes and take the don's <laughs> vote away. But if you think about it, it is a problem. I used to walk with my papaws, I remember walking with my papa Earl, and he explained the world to me. 
And there was such wisdom in this country man from West Virginia that I will never learn more than I learned walking with him. But he also knew what he didn't know. These are dock workers. They're actually working on the Olympic, if you look carefully. But the dock workers who were working on RMS Titanic built the ship. And they did well, but not very well. They didn't know enough to know that some of what they were doing was helping doom the liner. And yet, the people who should have known, the educated, they're the ones who fail. But I want you to see that the folk wisdom of the docker, the practical wisdom of the commons that benefited me all my life and that must never be forgotten comes with limitations. The commons are limited in what they know. And so, Tim, you and I both say, I, I can't decide what the tariff should be. Should you? Mm -mm. So we need to find somebody that can. Because we might have some practical wisdom about it, but we don't know. Now, this tempts me to say, let's put the brightest and best in charge. Let's put the people who know in charge, educated opinion. But folks, if there's any group of people who can fall into groupthink, it's educated people. And if you don't believe that, work in a company and be doomed when you hear the phrase best practices. <laughs> All over America right now, universities are heading off a cliff into financial ruin. School after school, I'd be called in to consult with schools that are now closed, and I'd say, here's what I know you're going to do, A, B, and C. None of it's going to work. Why? Because these are best practices your consultant has told you to do. Every single school is going to do them. At some point, too many schools have done it, so it isn't going to work. Groupthink can occur in a small group of educated people just like it can occur in any other group. And so the more educated people become insulated from the people doing the work, the worse it is. The worse it is. Why does every administrator at St. Constantine teach? Every single person who works here teaches. Why? Yeah, that's right. That's it. You know, when I had to teach the freshmen Plato yesterday, they don't care what I've done. They want a good class. And I can't go with a war story from when I started teaching. They don't care and they shouldn't care. I have to go in and govern them by what? Consent. The consent of the governed. And if you're a teacher and the students withdraw their consent, they don't have to get in trouble. They can just tune out. And I will have failed. So we can't just turn things over to the brightest and the best. We need some interplay between the commons, the docker, and the dawn. And I think democracy can do that if we do our work. Our government has tried to protect us against mob rule or against elite rule by dividing power in our country, which is very large, between states and the central government. When states, several of them in the South, took away the civil liberties of up to 40 to 50 percent of the population, the central government had to intervene to protect the rights of individuals in those states. Thank God. If the federal government becomes unjust, and begins to say to religious people, you can't pray as you want to. State governments can intervene and provide safe havens. In the same way, we have three branches of government so that even the central government moves very, very slowly. Eventually, if a majority of Americans want something, they'll get it, but not quickly, so that we don't have 
a mob, a flash mob, that decides we should do this. In the 19th century, Christians said, you know what, the Constitution doesn't mention Jesus. We should put God and Jesus in the Constitution. And since we have a supermajority as Christians, who stopped that from happening? Who stopped it? Atheists? Man, you could have put all the atheists in Texas in this room. <laughs> who stopped it? Christians. Had to be. Because we said, no, 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 that's like, these are the bylaws. You don't want to put every detail in the bylaws. Ever be in a corporation that bylaws got too long? Too detailed? This is how we govern. Not, we're not going to do that. And because it takes so long to the, amend the Constitution, it never happened. It's hard to amend the Constitution. And as a result, unless it's a very good idea, and people persist in wanting it, it goes away. It's a good thing. And so again, it protects us, because this we know. Jesus is Lord, but who will govern this side of paradise? Well, some people might say, what we need is another Constantine. But read the history of St. Constantine. Nobody gave him a manual of how to be a Christian Roman emperor. And so we would never want somebody to do exactly what he did again. Because we've learned a thing or two since the time of Constantine. He made mistakes we wouldn't make. We've learned about how to protect the subjects of the high king of heaven since the time of Constantine. We've also learned how Christians can best relate to non-Christian majorities and minorities. We've had to live as minorities inside of states and as super majorities. And we've learned through our errors. The Orthodox, so we're at an Orthodox school, what's one thing we've contributed to the discussion? There is always in Orthodoxy, there always has been a role for the lay ruler. Emperor, how many heads on the eagle? Two. Two. Come on, man. Like, look around, look at the door. How many heads on the eagle? You want there to be two heads on the eagle. There's one head on the eagle, it's going to scratch you. The two heads will fight with each other and leave you alone. That's, that's, that's the goal. And one way of looking at the two heads, church, state, one body. Lay people ran the schools. Wealthy patrons. The church did religious things. And they always were in tension with each other. As a regular West Virginian, I always want powerful people to be in tension with each other. Because when they're in tension with each other, they're not killing us. Right? You want powers to be in tension because then we can have liberty. And so, do we want the church to run everything? Traditionally, the Orthodox have said no. There is a role for the emperor. Now, uh, I have an insight again. We do not have an Eastern Roman emperor currently. <laughs> this is problematic if you're looking to the emperor to save you from problems. There's a wonderful moment in C.S. Lewis's novel, That Hideous Strength, where Merlin is brought back from the past, and he looks around England and he says, man, your king is useless, parliament is corrupt, we've got to appeal to foreign rulers, and unfortunately the character Ransom has to say to Merlin, bad news, this corruption exists all over Christendom. Churches are empty, rulers are corrupt, parliaments are full of mobs, we're in real trouble. And so Merlin says, okay, we're going to have to do it. The time has come to appeal to the emperor. And the key moment in the book is when the emptiness of the world is revealed to Merlin. And Ransom says, there is no Christian emperor. And Merlin howls in fear. Because what will protect us from the shadow of that hideous strength. Arguably in the Orthodox world there was a kind of emperor until about 1918. 
After all, the Russian royal family took the title Tsar, which should suddenly strike you as being a lot like Caesar, because it was. And the family's title was they were the family Romanov. Sometimes history rhymes. <laughs> uh, I have good news for you. We don't need an emperor. We have the St. Constantine School for a very simple reason. And here it is. Governance rooted in an autocrat or oligarchs has worked less well for the development of human rights. So what if we did this? What if we said to ourselves, we need a republic, a republic of many Constantines and Helens. What if you're the next emperor, and you, and you? What if we are the lay rulers? What if all of you get a classical education, and poor Tim and I can turn governance over to the 10th grade? That's the project. A renewal of American democracy with the lessons of justice that came to us from the greatest generation, their wrongs to right in a republic of Constantines and Helens. So help us, God. One cheer for American democracy. If it raises up for the commons, people to exercise our government. Thank you. I'll take questions if you have I got to skip all the evil things the Orthodox have done. You know, and it's sort of, I intentionally timed it that way, so I wouldn't have to admit to any of it. Yeah? How do you explain these things? I have a secular friend, you haven't met her, but I have a secular friend who thinks that Christians want to take over power in the United States so that we can persecute people like her. How do you yeah. explain to them that that... Well, uh, first of all, and really good news for her, and kind of sad news from my papa's point of view, uh, if you were still with us, there aren't enough of us to do that. But second of all, when we could have, we mostly didn't. Atheism, after all, could only exist on our sufferance when we were a super, super majority. And we have allowed, I, look, not hooray for us, we're so awesome, but it is okay to keep score about good things we did, right? We have allowed Amish communities to exist as an alternative society without serving in the armed forces and living an autonomous life for centuries to the point that they are now booming in terms of population uh, if it continues, everyone in America will ultimately be Amish <laughs> at their current rate of growth. Uh, don't worry, I already told you that the past is no perfect predictor <laughs> of the future. Eventually there will be some kind of like Amish linen who will destroy uh, Amish linens, and it will be bad. I mean, who knows? Who knows what this would be? It's a great novel, though, if somebody wants to write it. But the, the point is this. Uh, we've learned a thing or two from the past. And what we've learned is this, coercion doesn't work. It's bad for religion. So when we could have established a state religion, I mean, my papa's generation, go read Franklin Roosevelt on the Second World War. It was a crusade of Christendom against evil. I mean, if someone got up of either political party and just read Franklin Roosevelt's speech about the Second World War, people go crazy in fear. But Franklin Roosevelt was not about to impose a theocracy on America. Just look up how he died. Right? When we were praying in schools, John F. Kennedy was president. That wasn't the handmaid's tale. Right? But even then, I'm not sure that Christians are that eager for that. I, I once asked a bishop 
what is our foreign policy? He said, we're for anyone who won't kill us. <laughs> this seemed good. <laughs> seemed like a good basic policy. So I think, if I think you're a soul created in the image of God, and that God has given you rights, and that not, I, I have to treat you as an equal, not because I think I'm better than you, but because I think you're so awesomely cool that I can't be trusted with your awesome coolness. That's not really very worrisome. Yeah. Now, look, there are insane Christians. I think uh, she may have come across. Them. Yeah, I'm, as as my papa would say, I'm again them. You know, I, somebody once left my uh, great grandfather's sermon and said, you know, he preached against sin because he was against it. And that's a pretty good summary of my position. I am against evil. Evil is bad. And so the Christian position over time has become more about negative rights. What if I don't bother you as much as is possible if you don't bother anyone else? And what if we make rules as generic as possible for the good of the republic and we all just go along best we can? Because any time we've tried more than that, how has that gone? Terrible. Yeah. I mean, look, I love U.S. Grant. Like, I really love U.S. Grant. He really got a bad shake. And after Reconstruction, people decided to hate him because he busted up the Klan. So hooray for U.S. Grant. But U.S. Grant, oh gosh, he decided to help the Indians. And man, it would have been better if he hadn't helped the Indians. Like, I'm going to clean up Indian affairs. We're going to stop cheating the Indians. We're going to educate the Indians. The minute the government starts helping you, how's that going to go? Right? The, the help was worse. Uh, it was almost worse than the abuse. So uh, we've learned a thing or two over time, I hope. But if you run into a Christian who hasn't learned a thing or two over time, send them to a St. Constantine school so they can learn. <laughs> Right? We need to educate the folks. Because there are plenty of Christians that just hate on the Enlightenment. Why? What is there about your rights coming from God that you hate? Is that a terrible idea? Gosh, I wish we could go back to when I had no rights, and we picked our rulers by having a woman hold a sword out of a lake and someone pick it up. I, I watched too much Money Python to think that's a good idea as a kid. Uh, do you see my point? Like, we've learned over time. And sometimes we get so discouraged that we forget what we've learned. Now, remember I told you the form of government for Christians can vary. It might be that we would get in a situation where we would need a stronger, more centralized government. Yes? Then we have but I go into that with great caution, but possible. Different forms of government can be acceptable, as long as they don't do what thing? Trample the governance power, the consent of the governed. Sometimes we have to be protected from a mob. Yeah? Lynch justice might win a vote. But it's still wrong. Yes, sir. Um, shouldn't we be focusing more on culture and education than we should on government? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Ready? What do I do for a living? <laughs> yes, there we go. But unfortunately, uh, as much as I would like to ignore government, government does not ignore me. Does that make sense? Also, look, you look around town. Bad things are happening to people because of injustice done by government. And I can't be sanguine about that. Where the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are being trampled, I've got to at least use my vote to stand against it and be for the other thing. And I'll make mistakes as I do it. Now, do I think ultimately, I think government is downstream of culture. And yet, here I am standing downstream. 
So sure, what should we build? Colleges and schools. Let's build a city, Constantinople. We'll call it Houston. And we will live here and we will make it a better place in a community. But unfortunately, we probably won't just be left alone. So we take the tools we have under the Constitution of 1789 and we apply them best we can. Will we all agree about what is best to do? No, that's the joy of it. In the frisson of our disagreement, somebody will come up with a good idea. And I bet it won't be me. It'll almost surely be a 10th grader. I've given them such a <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say um, that you talked about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution projected the need for equality, you know, which is important under law or so on and so forth, into other areas. And so I guess I just, I know we're nearly out of time, but I feel like people have lost the, don't have the understanding of, like, like you mentioned, equity. Yeah. And finding, giving people individually what is needed and yes. so forth to address that. And how, as Christians, can we um, kind of gently lead people cause, who see that as preferential treatment or whatever, or discrimination, when in, in actuality it's, again, individualized things. You know, if this person, this thing, they eat it, they can die because they're allergic. So they shouldn't eat the same thing as this person or so on. How can we let people see that difference is not better or worse? Yeah, that is very hard because um, we're generally wicked uh, <laughs> as people, and we immediately, it just becomes full of graft and corruption, right? But I'll say a simple thing. If someone's starving to death, abstract discussions are not much good, right? But here's an insight. What if we fed them? Right? What if we fed them? Sometimes I think we push off our moral obligations on someone else, like abstract political discussions. Oh, what we should do is create a giant nonprofit to feed them. Uh, here's a thought. What if we fed them? Right now. But sometimes, here's a hard tension. When Mike, I had a grandfather who worked for Union Carbide, and he was grateful for it. He would start to cry when he described getting a job with Union Carbide because he'd never had cash until they gave him the job. He was so grateful. But while he was working for them, He'd come home, and it looked like it snowed on him because they had him cutting asbestos. And what they discovered was the company calculated what they'd have to pay Nana when he died of asbestosis, which he did. And it wasn't worth giving him a mask. Now, somebody ought to have done something for Pat. But he didn't know. He needed justice. Mm -hmm. Yes? Now, how? Oh, that's above my paper. But I know it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. I know it wasn't right. But I'll tell you how Papaw practiced justice. He was drowning to death of asbestosis. It's the way you die. And he was at home, because eventually they send you home. You know what made him happy? He's in Great Depression guy, and he came from the country, so he had a freezer, and he filled it with ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> because at some point, the doctor says, go home and eat whatever you want. It was <laughs> glorious, and what he wanted to eat year-round ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> and he would just go open the freezer and look at them, and it made him happy. <laughs> it's like, look, it's a poor taste of paradise. So he's in bed, and they lived in the city because Nana loves living in the city under a street light because it was all this free electricity just coming down, <laughs> coming down. She just, just stand there. She could not understand young people that wanted to move back to the country because it's so hard to get light. She had worked so hard to get light. Anyway, he's lying there, and somebody starts getting mugged out in the back. 
Now, equality says call somebody. Start a program. Somebody ought to do something. My pet Moro got out of his bed and chased that man down the street and then went back and got his medical kit from the plant and bound that man's wound and sent him home. And Nana said, Earl, what are you doing? And he looked at her and he said, what was he going to do, kill me? <laughs> and so I want to suggest that sometimes we don't bring equity to our culture because we're dying and we don't know it. And we don't have the courage of my grandfather to act hmm. in justice. Hmm. And we need to act in justice ourselves and stand and do. And I'll, I'll end. <coughs> Let, here's my shout out to monarchy. You ready for a shout out to monarchy? <laughs> it's a St. Constantine school. We have to have one. Yeah, how many cheers does monarchy get? Yeah, uh, <laughs> half a cheer. <laughs> one cheer for democracy. Constitutional monarchy may get a cheer and a half. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but I want you to hear something. How does God judge? King Jesus, how does he judge? He judges with perfect equity. With perfect equity. And so there's my grandfather choking to death in the hospital. I can't imagine anyone less important as this world counts important. Nobody said his name outside our family. Right. He's a great man, built a church, faithful servant of God. And as he was dying, my mom was there, of course, and he, he said this, and can you hear it? I said, no, Dad, I, I can't hear it. And he said, it's the bells. The bells bells, bells, because the high king of heaven welcomed my papa into paradise, because he was a king's son, and Union Carbide didn't care, but Jesus cared, mm -hmm. and the government may remember him through some tax roll on some record. But his name was written on the palm of the Son of God. Why can your friend trust this system? Because God loves an atheist who is equally created in the image of God and bears the marks of sovereignty and the rights of a subject of the high king of heaven. And God will judge. God will judge. And that may be a fearful thing, or it may be, as Papa found it, a good thing. But God knows. And he judges with perfect equity, because God alone can be trusted with sovereignty. Thank you.